All right, please sign into the attendance when you can. Okay, we'll start in one minute. All right, welcome back everyone. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay. All right, let's try to start with a few questions. This is the class notes are over here. Um, I want to now uh, see your grasp of the cases. Um, I know in some of your classes, it's not very important to know the names of the cases. Um, in this class, it is. Um, by the end of the semester, we'll have about 70 or so cases and you'll need to know them. Uh, you might not remember the exact name, but a lot of them you should. Okay, so let's try these four questions in rapid succession. Uh, I'll go over them after they're done. I'll make them short answer. Um, your spelling does not have to be perfect, but try to get as close as possible as you can. Okay, question number one, which case introduced the direct effects test. Okay, another 15 seconds or so. Okay. Five more seconds. All right, I'm gonna stop it here. All right, question number two. Which case introduced the substantial effects test? Good, five more seconds. Okay, good. Question number three. <clears throat> Which case introduced the aggregation principle? Which case introduced the aggregation principle? Good, another 10 seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, good. All right, last question in the, in the, in the cycle. Which case applied the jurisdictional hook or the jurisdictional element test? Okay, another 10 seconds. All right, five more seconds. Okay. All right, let's see how we did. All right, 
The first question was which case introduced the direct effects test? The answer is EC9, okay? Um, EC9, I think most of you got that. Um, a couple people put Schechter, some put DeWitt, which actually is not a bad answer, but it's not the right one. Um, but the best answer is EC9, and I know people spelled it different ways, so don't, don't worry if you got the spelling a little bit wrong, that's fine. Um, this case held that manufacturing comes before commerce and that manufacturing may have an indirect effect on interstate commerce, though it's not a direct effect. Um, this was a test introduced in 1895. All right, question number two. Which test, so which case introduced substantial effects? The answer here is Darby. So I think most of you got this one right. If you spelled it U.S. v. Darby, Darby, whatever, those are all, those are all correct. Um, Darby held that you can regulate, I'm sorry, that Congress can regulate local economic activity if that local activity had a substantial effect in indirect commerce, I'm sorry, interstate commerce. Even if that effect was indirect, it didn't matter, right? What mattered was whether it was substantial, not whether it was direct. Okay, very good. Um, some of you put Jones and Laughlin Steel. That's not correct. Jones and Laughlin Steel did not introduce the substantial effects test. That came in Darby a couple years later. All right, so look at question number three. Which case introduced the aggregation principle? The answer is Wickard. And I think a lot of you got this one right. Oh, just about everyone. Good. I think, oh, I think we got 100% of this one. Very good. Uh, Wickard v. Filburn. Uh, Some more Wicker, close enough. Uh, Wickard v. Filburn involved the so-called aggregation principle. Even if a single person's local activity did not have a substantial effect on interstate commerce, if you aggregate, that is, if you add together all the local people and all their local activity in the aggregate, it would have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Very good. All right. The fourth question involves a jurisdictional hook element. Um, if you notice, I said which case applied it. So actually, it wasn't quite which introduced it. That's not entirely clear. But I think the best case here is Katzenbach versus McClung. I think that's the case I was looking for. And I think a lot of you put that just with different spellings, which are all fine. Katzenbach. Um, but the answer here is not hard of Atlanta. And that one I can say is wrong. Um, the reason why is that hard of Atlanta didn't rely on the jurisdictional hook element. Instead, it said there's a hotel that uh, 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 marketed to out-of-state customers and that the people themselves were actually the interstate commerce. Um, you didn't need the hook element that the hotel served food made in other states, that the people themselves were the commerce. Um, but in Katzenbach, which involved a local restaurant, they didn't have people traveling from out of state to go there. So they had to rely on this jur jurisdictional hook element. Okay. That's a brief summary of the last three classes. Um, those are the major tests. You had direct effects, you had substantial effects, you had aggregation doctrine, and you have this so-called jurisdictional hook test. I think that is a decent summary of where we've been the past week. Okay. Questions on that introduction? <clears throat> if you got any of those wrong, uh, go back and, and check your notes and see... Uh, where you might have missed a few of these tests because you'll need to know these 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 uh, frameworks pretty cold, unfortunately. Yeah. In a lot of classes, case names aren't important, but here they, they are quite important. Professor, this is this is Moses. Hey Moses, how you doing? Uh, I'm still a little unclear um, <laughs> by exactly what you mean when you say jurisdictional hook. Yeah. I know that in the McClellan case, they looked at the fact that some of the food was was that came into the restaurant was purchased across state lines. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of how they were able to decide the case, but I'm still unclear on the concept, I guess. Sure. Um, okay, thanks, thanks Moses for the question. And I see James, your hands up, I'll get, I'll get there in a minute. Um, when you think of a hook, right, it, it's to connect you to something, right? You, you, you hook something in. Uh, if you ever see, like, you know, Back to the Future, right, you know, the hook was to connect to the, pow the power supply, right? Um, 
you need with a local restaurant some connection, some link, some hook to interstate commerce. In the restaurant case, they didn't serve out-of-state customers. The only connection, the only hook they had to interstate commerce was the fact that they served food that came from out-of-state, right? The phrase jurisdiction here doesn't mean like, you know, diversity jurisdiction, right? It doesn't mean like, you know, subject matter jurisdiction. It means how do you get to Congress's power? How do you get to the power to regulate interstate commerce? And the hook, the connection to that power is based on the fact that the restaurants serve food that was manufactured in other states, right? That's, that's the hook, right? As soon as your business touches anything that's been in interstate commerce, you're now under Congress's authority under Katzenbach. Uh, in our supplement, we use this sort of gross phrase, but it works. Um, the jurisdictional hook theory, I tell you it's gross, it's sometimes called the herpes theory of federal power. Uh, because once once you touch the federal power in any regard, you're permanently tainted. You, you can't get rid of it. Um, so, so the second you have some food that came from another state or, or an oven or a dishwasher or whatever, you're now within the Fed's power. Does that, Moses, that clean things up a little bit? Yes, thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Yeah, James, go ahead. Okay, um, so you talk about the, the direct end effect, indirect effect is EC9, and they kind of, I mean, they talk about yes. it, but it's really articulated in, super well yeah, in Schechter. The other, in Schechter. So if, we're, if we get a question around that time, can we use the discussion in Schechter? which seems to be just cleaner and... Yes, yeah. So if, if you're in 1895, you're limited to EC night. But if you're in 19, it was a 35, you can talk about Schechter. That's right. It, it, it's, okay. I, I understand why people put Schechter there because it, it explains it in a very neat fashion. I'm, I'm with you 100%. But I think everything was... I think the direct... If you read EC night, it talks about having an indirect effect. And that, that's basically the, the direct effects test. That makes sense, James? Yeah, they never actually say. They don't call it that, but that that that's that's where it was introduced. Okay, thank you. How's everything at school going? Quiet. Uh, it's good. The same. There's more people here now. Oh, why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. People know that it's open. I guess. Is it harder for you to find a room? No, no, no. I mean, it's relative. Like now, there are probably five people in, on a floor. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, glad glad you're there. All right. Thanks, James. All right, any other questions before we move on to today's material? All right, well, let me... I'm sorry, who's talking? I, I can't, I don't see a hand. Clayton, my bad. Okay, Clayton, go ahead. I don't want to pull you too far off topic, but uh, your co-author was a part of the Reich case. He was. Uh, that gave him a lot of, you know, just in, like unique perspective on being able to write the case for the book. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, if you watch the video, you can actually hear Randy's arguments, um, which are helpful. Um, yeah, look, I mean, uh, Randy is a, a, a dear colleague. Um, he argued this case. He lost. I mean, obviously, he didn't, he didn't win the case. Um, but, but he gained an appreciation of the necessary and proper clause that most people don't have. Um, Randy was also instrumental in the Obamacare challenge, which we'll talk about, I think, next week. Um, the reason why I think Randy had such a big impact in the ACA litigation was that he understood the necessary and proper clause in ways most people did not. Um, I think you will. Most people don't. Uh, most people simply don't grasp the independent nature of the necessary and proper clause. I didn't either when I was in law school. I had very good professors. I don't think I learned it properly, uh, but I think hopefully you all will. What is your backdrop? What is that? Uh, I am at the ruins of the Death Star on, I believe, Yavin. I'm not 100 percent sure. Oh god, is that from the new movies? Yes, sir. I tried watching them; they were really bad on Disney Plus. They were, they were, they were really bad. Uh, I'm running out of backgrounds for things okay. from the previous movies, and I've had to uh, indoor. I apologize. I, I I've moved on to <laughs> the newer movies now. Okay. I, I think I'm just going to keep the bit going for as long as I can. All right, all right, Colin. I think your hand up. Uh, this is. Is that Star Wars? No. <laughs> no, 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 not Star Wars related, but it is slightly off topic, at least for today. Um, so parties cannot raise new issues in appeal 
but can the Supreme Court test the constitutionality of something sui sponte or no? Uh, that's a really good question, right? So, so generally, um, issues that are waived below are not preserved, right? If you don't raise an issue in the trial court, it's waived. So, you know, that, that's your error. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't always play by those rules. Um, in some cases, they might raise an issue that none of the parties consider below. And I'll actually give you one more. There might be cases where neither party wants to argue a position. So the Supreme Court simply appointed a lawyer to argue a position, right? Basically, the Supreme Court say, okay, the government doesn't want to take this position. The, the plaintiff doesn't all appoint someone else to argue it. But what's called an amicus, a friend of the court. Um, you know, it helps resolve issues, but I'm not a fan of it. I think it's it's fake. You know, it, it, it there, there should be... An, if you have an actual issue that's presented squarely in the case, I think the amicus is fine, but very often the court will sort of go off on a tangent and, and it's, if there's no adversity in an issue, I think it's problematic. All right, sewer cut. Um, for your question, when we started on the potential X test, can you argue that it started with Hammer? It seems... Uh, no, Hammer, I think, applies to direct effects test. What's your argument, though? Maybe, maybe, well, maybe, tell me what your argument is. Well, because Darby was... Darby was that they were trying to see activities that were getting into commerce, which I feel like Hammer and the part, they were trying to regulate um, products produced by children getting into you know, commerce. Yeah, but the, but the court relied yeah, on the same line as East United. Yeah. But no, no, but but it, it's it'll still whether the, the the local manufacturer had a direct effect in the state commerce. I don't think it has substantial effects. Okay. All right. Other questions? All right. I'll move on. Thanks, Stuart. Um. All right. So let's let's continue our discussion. Uh. You know, we started this topic in the eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties. Um. Then we moved on to the 1890s and early 1900s. And then we moved on to the 1930s, 1940s. And then we did the 1960s, right? So we have almost 100 years of cases um, involving the Commerce Clause and the Nestor and Proper Clause. <clears throat> Once you get past 1964, things sort of leveled out. Um, the New Deal court had more or less set the precedent. The substantial effects test in combination with the aggregation principle were in effect. And these tests were very broad. Um, Congress could sweep in just about anything they wanted to do. Any sort of local economic activity Congress wants to regulate they seem to be able to. Um, almost all the Commerce Clause challenges brought in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s failed. And uh, generations of law students came of age thinking that the federal government's powers were unlimited. That if Congress wanted to do something, they could find a way to accomplish it. Um, that sort of settlement, that consensus was challenged in 1995 with our next case, um, United States against Lopez. Um, now, I just want to give a little bit of background on this case. I think it's important. Um, the facts... Actually, I'll see the facts. Uh, oh, let me call on someone. Who's up next? Where am I up to? I think that's me. Who's me? Oh, Erica. Sorry. Thank you, Erica. I, 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 your face doesn't always pop up when you say it's me, so I'm sorry. I can't always see who is speaking. Erica, please, you want to give me the facts in Lopez? Um, yes. So um, in 1990, uh, Congress passed the Gun-Free School Zones Act. <laughs> 
And um, in 92, um, a 12th grader uh, came to his high school with a concealed uh, 38 caliber. I don't know how to all say that. Yeah, 38 caliber. That's exactly right. It's okay. revolver. It's revolver. And, um, and with bullets. And so he was arrested, um, taken out of school, um, and charged under state law. Ah, so at the time, in te- by this was outside of San Antonio. Uh, at the time, Erica, was it a crime under state law to have a gun in a school zone? Um, yes. I mean, that's why he was arrested. Right, okay, so he was arrested, charged with a state crime. What happened next? Um, well, they dropped the charges um, and charged him with a federal crime. Who, who's they? Just, so oh, who, who, uh, who dropped the charges and who dropped the federal tra- agents? Ah, so the state prosecutor, the state district attorney dropped the charges, and then he was charged by the federal government. Is that right? Yes. Why? Why, why uh, didn't this, he? Why, why didn't Lopez get get prosecuted in the state court system? Because he violated the uh, federal gun free school zone act. No, I, I know he did, but why? But but he also violated the state Texas law. Yes. Why didn't well, the state prosecute him? They already char- they arrested him. Why didn't they prosecute him? Um, because I, well, I mean, the federal act, um, trumps the state law. Are you saying that he could not have been prosecuted by the states? Um, I mean, I think he can, um, but, Hmm. um, I mean, I think it's just the fact that the, it's a, it's a federal law and that's, um, harsher than the. Oh, so uh, I'll save you just for another minute, Erica. If you're a prosecutor, right? Mm-hmm. And you have a choice that you can prosecute Lopez yourself or let the federal government do it. What do you choose? Um, the federal government. Why? Um, because, uh, I mean, it's cheaper. For them. It's cheaper for who? It's a cheaper size. Why is it cheaper for the state? Now you're on the right track. That way, the I mean, so the state doesn't the state doesn't prosecute them. Yes. Yep. And what else will the state not have to do? What happens if it gets convicted? Um. The state wouldn't have to. Um. I mean, hold him. And and what 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 was was it mean to hold the person? What does it actually mean? Um, imprison him. Is that expensive? Yes. Ah, okay. Very excellent, Erica. Thank you. I, I suck on you a little bit longer than I expected, but I think you got, got exactly where I want to go. Um, it's very often the case that the same conduct violates both state law and federal law. And in this case, Lopez had a gun in a school that violated both state law and federal law. The state police arrested him. Now, why didn't they prosecute him? It's cheaper and easier to let the feds do it. You don't have to pay to prosecute. You don't have to pay to keep him in jail. You don't have to pay for a parole officer or anything other, uh, any other conditions you have. So it's very often that the state police says, okay, not a problem. Feds, your you're problem, you deal with this. So what started off as a simple state offense, having a gun in a school, became a federal offense. And it became one of the first prosecutions under this brand new law, the Gun Free School Zone Act of 1990. All right, uh, Erica, Jeffrey here. You're Jeffrey? Yeah. All right, Jeffrey. So um, uh, Lopez gets assigned a public defender, right? A federal public defender. Right. Um, he's guilty. He did it. Right. There's no there's no dispute of fact. He brought the gun to school. What would usually happen if you're the federal public defender and your your guy is guilty, dead to right? He did it. Lopez had the gun to school. There's no mitigating circumstances. He, he, he did it. He goes. Let's just assume he was 18 years old. He's majority right. Um, he's a 12th grader. What would the public defender usually recommend his client do? Plead guilty. Why? Uh, unless harsher sentence. Good. Is that what happened here? No. What happened here? 
uh, on appeal, they argued that the uh, statute was unconstitutional. Like it wasn't in Congress's power. Very good, very good. Um, thank you, thank you, Jeffrey. In most cases, federal criminal defendants don't go to trial. It's very rare. If any of you work for a prosecutor's office or a district attorney or for um, a public defender, the overwhelming majority of cases are resolved with what's called a guilty plea, where Lopez says, yep, you know what, I did it. I'm not going to contest it. And in exchange for a guilty plea, the government offers a um, recommendation for a reduced sentence. Lopez's lawyer here was a guy named Jack Carter. Um, I emailed him many years ago. He never replied. I have no idea if he's even still alive. Um, but he had an idea. He said, wait a minute. This law, this new federal law, bans the possession of a gun in a school zone. Hmm. Can Congress do that? And Lopez's lawyer had enough foresight to preserve a constitutional challenge. He said, you know what? We are going to dispute the constitutionality of this of this statute. Now, again, in 1995, or I guess the case began even earlier, in 92, um, the Supreme Court had sent no signal that this case would be viable. Indeed, every single case up to this point had ruled in favor of federal power, but he raised this argument. And he won. Now, I don't tell you this to, you know, brag, but law students far too often, you know, accept the current legal system. You know, what's the majority rule? What's the minority rule? Well, okay, those are good questions. Uh, but this case illustrates the bounds of those thinking. And you may be confronted with a case at some point in your career where the doctrine um, maybe isn't where you want it to be. And I think this case illustrates what you can do about it. Um, perhaps one approach is to simply say, well, 100 years of precedent are wrong. We should overturn Wicker v. Filburn, overturn Darby, overturn Jones and Laughlin Steel, overturn all those cases. Okay. Um, if that's your argument, you are probably going to lose, right? You're not going to go to court and ask a trial judge to overrule Supreme Court precedent. You're losing, right? You're not going to lose. I mean, you're not going to win. There's, 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 you have a zero percent chance of success. But Lopez's lawyer, I think, made a different argument. He says, "Well, we have these precedents. Um, we have all these precedents, but." Those precedents do not support this statute, this gun-free school zone law. Why? Right? Why? Kevin, are you here? Yes, Professor. Kevin, why was the Gun-Free School Zone Act different from past laws that the court had upheld. What about this law was different? The argument, I think, was that it didn't have to do with economic commerce. You're really close. You said economic commerce. I don't think it's... It, well, well, it didn't have to do with, uh, with the economic aspect of commerce. It wasn't the actual selling or buying or moving of cars. You're, you're giving the exact word, but the phrase is not economic commerce. The phrase is economic something else. You're, you're so close. I, it's like I don't want to throw it off. I don't want to give it to you. It's not economic yeah. commerce. It's economic blank. I, I, uh, I don't remember that. They said something about economic... Begins with an A. Uh, S, aspect? No. Uh, no. Oh, so close. Activity. Activity, that's right. Okay, good. All right, but, but you, you had the right idea, and I saw that I knew you had the right idea there. All right, so Kevin, help me out here. What exactly is an economic activity? Um, so I think the best way to, to look at it is 
it's the it's it's cost. It actually have to do with money or, or financial aspects of some kind. But buying or selling, I guess, is a simple way of putting it. Ah, okay. Uh, the government tried to make an aspect of the cost of crown uh, argument for economics. Okay, good, good, good. All right, uh, let's see who's next. Uh, Sierra, you here? Sierra? No? Uh, Gavin? Gavin's here. So, Gavin, let's just be very precise here for a second, okay, Gavin? What exactly... Uh, Gavin, what exactly is the activity that Congress is regulating here? Congress is a, they're regulating the activity of people who knowingly carry a firearm onto school property or within a thousand feet of school property. Okay. So the activity being regulated here is the possession of the firearm in a school zone, right? Okay. Does this statute make it a crime to buy a gun? No, it does not involve. Uh, sell a gun? No. Um, you know, uh, transport a gun across state lines? No. Okay, so it's simple possession within a state. Now let me, let me twist the hypothetical, right? What if instead of Lopez just possessing the gun... What if he had sold the gun to his buddy for 50 bucks, right? He just said, here, you want this gun? I'll give you $50. Would that activity have been different? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, tell me why, please. Because then it is involving some aspect of economic activity. As uh, but, but he was selling it only in, in San Antonio. There's no border crossing or anything else. How can Congress regulate this local... Activity. Well, I mean, if you consider past precedents such as like Whitford, good. Whitford and the aggregation principle, if, um, you know, many people were allowed to make black market deals of firearms and such like that, um, that affected school property, then it would also have, it would also be an economic activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you, Gavin. So I think, I think we heard a couple things there I want to repeat that are, that are important, right? Congress can regulate local activity, right? Congress can regulate local activity if it is economic in nature. Congress can regulate local activity <clears throat> if it's economic in nature. That is what Lopez held. And that's how Lopez read Morrison. I'm sorry, how, the, how Lopez read uh, a wicker in past precedence. Right? Congress can regulate local activity that's economic in nature. Even if that local activity does not cross state lines, that local activity may have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. In other words, you only use the aggregation principle to aggregate the effects of economic activity. One more time. You're only going to use the aggregation principle, Wickard, to aggregate the economic effect, I'm sorry, the aggregate, the, the, the substantial effect of economic activity. But if the activity is non-economic, if the activity is non-economic, Wickard is not relevant. If the activity is non-economic, you don't get to the aggregation doctrine. Okay. The entire thrust of Lopez turns on whether the activity in question is economic in nature. And that's the phrase you have to keep in mind in today's cases. 
is this local intrastate activity economic in nature? Okay. And the court holds that the possession of a gun, the simple possession of a gun in a school zone is not intrastate economic activity. The simple possession of a gun in a school zone is not intrastate activity that's economic. All right. Questions? Yes, Eileen, go ahead. Did you say not interstate or not intrastate? I said a lot of things, which which should be the full sentence. The, the holding, the possession is not intrastate activity that is economic. Right. It, 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 oh, well, yeah. I, yeah I, I, okay. So the, the possession of a gun is intrastate activity. Right. It's intrastate. You're only having it in one state. But it's not economic in nature. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yes, Macy, go ahead. Why does it not extend to like how he got the gun? You don't just like come into possession of a gun. You ah, what are you asking about? What what case are you trying to bring in? You're doing something very good right here, right here. What what are you asking about that that we've studied so far? Uh, the, I guess it'd be similar to Kotzenbach. Good. What what do we call that thing? I think Moses asked about uh, earlier in this this session. What's that thing called? The jurisdictional hook. Good. I'm glad you said the herpes theory. Yeah, it's the jurisdictional hook, right? So. Um, Macy, what if the statute had said um, you cannot have a gun in a school zone if that gun was purchased in interstate commerce? That you know the, the bullets came from out of state and the and, and the metal came out of state. Would that be permissible? Could Congress have enacted that statute that says if the gun traveled in interstate commerce, you cannot bring that gun to a school zone? Why? Because the law is specifically stating the gun came from interstate commerce. Very good. But why would, I guess I just don't understand why you have to specifically say that because the gun. Ah. Uh, like you can't. I don't. I don't understand why we're just assuming that there's just this poof and there's a gun. It doesn't make sense to me. So what was the court doing? So, so just I want to make this point clear, uh, Macy. Did the statute in question here include a jurisdictional hook? No. No. Why did Congress not put in one sentence this gun travel in interstate commerce? Why did gun? Why did Congress not put that sentence in? I don't really know. Yeah, neither do I. We don't really know. Actually, they got maybe lazy, right? They got you know they ah oh, whatever the court will pull whatever it doesn't matter. But maybe I, they probably thought they didn't have to. Oh, that's a good answer. Why do you think they didn't have to? I think they didn't have to. Well, because I think most reasonable people assume that if you get a gun, it comes from somewhere. Yeah, and I think the dissenters probably make that assumption also. So then what was the majority doing here? Was the majority... Uh, what do you think the majority was doing here, then, Macy? I think you're, you're on a very good uh, uh, line of a path, a line of uh, thought. I... And I guess kind of forcing Congress's hand to be more specific about yeah. their power. Yeah, yeah, very good. So I, th I think Macy raised a few points. I want to just I want to highlight them. Um, most people, I think, would reasonably assume that a gun that you have traveled in interstate commerce. Now, it doesn't mean you bought it from another state, but maybe the parts of the gun were made out of state or the bullets came from out of state or maybe the holster came from out of state, right? Almost everything comes from another state, right? You know, I remember years ago there were these guys, I think it was Montana, who tried to make what they called Liberty guns, which are guns manufactured entirely in the state. Okay, sure. But, but even if 
right? Even if uh, 3D printed guns, I, I know a lot about those. Um, even if you make your own 3D printed gun, guess what? The files came from the internet, your, your printer is manufactured in another state. You can, you can go down the line to this a million different ways. Um, but what the court says here is it's not enough to hypothesize and speculate where the gun came from. Congress must state clearly in the statute. Congress must state clearly in the statute what the jurisdictional hook is. Had Congress added a single sentence that says, if you have a gun that includes now, one of the ironies of this case, okay, enough in the chat. You guys are good. I think we, we enough of this Minecraft. We're going too far afield. Um, when you have a statute like this, right? When you have a statute like this, Congress must say with precision what the hook is. It could be a broad hook, but they have to state it. Um, it wasn't clear before Lopez this requirement existed. It could be that this case just made it up. Precedence during the New Deal. But we're not going further than those. We, we've gone so far, but we won't go further. In other words, if Congress, you want to regulate this going forward, you need to have a good limiting principle. You have to have a reason why. What's your jurisdictional hook? Um, so Lopez really introduced this important test that says Congress can only apply the substantial effects test if the activity is economic in nature. Right? In a statute that doesn't have this sort of hook, you need to have this economic activity. Now, I apologize, my live stream is on the fritz. Uh, my internet's acting up, but Zoom seems to be working just fine. <laughs> All right, everyone get the majority opinion in Lopez, right? Where Chief Justice Rehnquist sort of sketches out this, this, this requirement that you need to have economic activity to get to the substantial effects test. Yes, Jose, go ahead. Yeah, so I see what you're saying there. I don't understand the connection with the aggregation principle. I don't see how that, I would have gone definitely with, if I was the government with a jurisdiction or a hook or something. But the, but the statute didn't have one. Right? In other words, the government can't argue something that's not in the statute. Oh, okay. I see what you said. In other words, the, this, the, Congress actually reenacted this exact same law while the litigation was pending. Right? But the statute that, Jose, uh, that, um, that, that Lopez was charged under existed at the time to not have this hook. Okay? Make sense, Jose? Yes, sir. Thanks. All right. Let me, let me try this a different way. Um, Rehnquist, Rehnquist explains that there are three broad categories of activities that Congress can regulate. Okay, there are three broad categories of activities. So first, he looks at the so-called channels of interstate commerce, the channels of commerce. Um, the channels are, uh, think of like maybe the highways, the roads, the railroads, right? Um, these are the means by which people travel. So in a heart of Atlanta, for example, people are traveling from north to south and the court wanted to free those channels of um, you know, discrimination. Here you actually have things going between the states. Right? You actually have things going between the states. Congress can regulate local activities that block the flow of interstate commerce. Congress can regulate local activities that block the flow of interstate commerce. Okay, the second category is what's known as instrumentalities of commerce. I'll be honest, channels and instrumentalities sound the same thing to me. I, I, I can give you a distinction, but they're pretty similar. Um, 
So for example, uh, a railroad hub, train station, a port, right? But those are the same thing as instrumentalities and channels. I think they're the same. The most important category we have, though, is the third one, right? The third one, which is activities, right? Congress can regulate interstate activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. This is the application of the necessary and proper clause, right? Congress can regulate interstate activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. But in order for Congress to regulate such local activities, the activities must be economic in nature, right? The activities must be economic in nature. So for example, in Wickard, what was the activity? The activity was growing a wheat. In Darby, what was the activity? The activity was, um, uh, was it making lumber? In Katzenbach, what was the activity? Um, the activity was serving people in a restaurant. Right? All those activities are economic in nature. In contrast, the simple possession of a gun is not economic activity. Uh, yes, James, go ahead. So um, this, that fourth element, the interstate activity, if it's economic in nature, that's Rehnquist just saying that this is not something that's new. That's just analysis of the cases that we've seen. Not clear. Um, I think what Rehnquist did was he looked at these cases and he found a pattern. Um, in all these cases, economic activity was being regulated. I don't think those were essential holdings of the cases. I think that was just an element to the case. And Rehnquist said that's actually part of the holding. Um, but, you know, we can maybe defend him a little bit if you think about it. Generally, Congress regulates those who are engaged in economic activity. Congress was not regulating people who are just living their lives and going about their, their own business. So I think Rehnquist said this is going too far. Congress, if you want to regulate this local activity, must include a jurisdictional hook, which is not hard to do uh, at all. Okay, that makes sense, uh, James? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right, so Rehnquist says that the Gun Free School Zone Act has nothing to do with commerce or any sort of commercial enterprise, right? This is not economic activity. And then Rehnquist gives us other tests that would prove important later. Um, let me just read you this quote. He says, the Gun Free Schools on Act is not, quote, an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity. I'll say it again. The Gun Free School Zone Act is not an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity. What Rehnquist is getting at here is that in some cases, Congress can regulate local non-economic activity if this regulation of local non-economic, the non-economic activity is part of a broader regulation of economic activity. Hmm. Keep this in mind later. I'll just give you the preview. In Gonzalez versus Rage, which was the, the marijuana case we'll study later, the court, and I think Justice Scalia found this test was satisfied. That even if the local growing of marijuana was non-economic activity, Congress had the power to prohibit local marijuana as part of a large regulation of economic activity, which was the interstate drug market. So in some cases, when this is broad regulatory scheme, Congress can regulate local non-economic activity. But this was not such a case. The Gun Free Schools Act did not have that connection to interstate commerce. Okay. 
questions on the Lopez majority opinion? Questions on Lopez majority? All right. Uh, I want to focus a few other points on the majority. Chief Justice Rehnquist does not mention the Necessary and Proper Clause. He does not mention it. Uh, all he talks about is the Commerce Clause. Um, you know better. Uh, when he's talking about substantial effects, he's talking about Necessary and Proper. Um, this is what I mean when I say Randy understood this case when other people didn't. If you just read Lopez in a vacuum, you think, oh, it's all Commerce Clause. No, no, no. To get to this local activity, you would need to rely on the necessary and proper clause, right? And here the court says the substantial effects test only applies to intrastate economic activity, but non-economic activity is outside the scope of the substantial effects test. All right, everyone get that? Um, we had a bunch of separate opinions in, in Lopez. You'll find that there are lots of separate writings. You know, uh, Katzenbach and Hart Atlanta were all basically unanimous. Here, there was a lot of sort of disagreement on the case. Um, Justices Kennedy and O'Connor concurred, and they were worried what would happen if the federal government could take over so much of local authority. And indeed, in this case, you actually had the state police drop their prosecution to allow the feds to, to, to take over. Oh, uh, Smiha, I see your hands up. Yes, could you repeat what you just said about local activity in the necessary and proper clause? Oh boy. Uh, it, I said a lot of things about local activity and necessary and proper. Just read me what you have in your notes and I can maybe fill in the gap. Well, because one of the questions that I had was the purpose of the Gun Free Zone Act was in essence to protect children that were in school. So why would the, the necessary and proper clause apply? Well, because does, it's ne I don't know. Does that make sense what I'm asking? The starting point is what sorts of local activities can Congress regulate under the necessary and proper clause? According to the court. Wait, are you asking me? Yes, I'm asking you a question. According to the court, oh, sorry. according to the court, what sorts of activities can Congress regulate using the necessary and proper clause? Which is the economic? Aha. Uh -huh. So under the substantial effects test, Congress can regulate economic activity. Is protecting children economic activity, according to the majority? No. No. Okay. Now, I'll get to the dissent in a minute. Justice Breyer, and I think Justice Stevens as well, dissented. And Justice Breyer created this sort of um, argument. He said, well, protecting children does have an effect in economic and interstate commerce, right? Well, if, ki if kids can't go to school, they won't learn to read. If they don't learn to read, they won't become educated. If they won't become educated, they won't get jobs. And they won't get jobs, and the national economy will tank, right? He sort of built this... Um, chain of inferences, one on top of the other. Uh, the majority rejects it. They say, look, if this is the approach to constitutional law, then you can always make any argument that any activity is it, it has an effect in interstate commerce. Or if a butterfly flaps his wings, right, that's interstate commerce, right? Anything will. Um, the line the court draws here is economic versus non-economic activity. Right? If it's economic in nature, then yes, you can aggregate it up. But if it's not economic, it's beyond the scope of federal power. Look, here, the court's trying to draw a line. We know they drew a line once before in EC Knight between direct and indirect effects. And that line didn't work very well. Um, I think you can see probably pretty quickly that the economic, non-economic line would also not hold for very long. It would last about a decade. It was a, it was a good run, you know, about eight years or so but it didn't last very long. Okay. Other questions on the Lopez majority? 
Uh, Justice Thomas concurred, and we'll, we'll be learning quite a bit about Justice Thomas. Um, he, he was quite open in his view. Uh, he would overrule substantial effects. He would overrule Wicker tomorrow. He would overrule Darby tomorrow. Uh, he says these cases were wrongly decided. Uh, and they're consistent with the original meaning of the Constitution. They should be abandoned. Um, you'll find that on the court, Justice Thomas is the justice most willing to reconsider precedent. Uh, he, he does not believe in what's called stare decisis in the constitutional context, that if there's a, a decision that's wrong, it should be wiped away. Um, the dissenters were quite unhappy in this case, Justice Stevens in particular. And Stephen says, you know, if at any point since like the 1940s, if this case had come up, it would have come out the other way. And he's probably right. Um, I think we can safely say that the majority here um, uh, shifted course, right? I don't think they overruled doctrine. I think they were very careful not to. But they sort of drew a line in the sand. And they said, we're not going beyond this line. Uh, Randy, my colleague, describes it as uh, this far but no farther, right? That the court has approved a certain expansion of federal powers, but they won't go beyond that. But, but I think Stevens is correct by saying this is not what we've done before. That in the past, the court would defer to Congress's judgments about how to um, manage federal criminal law. Ultimately, this case didn't matter much, right? You know, I think this, this, this huge decision, why Congress enacted another version of the statute with a jurisdictional hook, it remains in the books today. It's never been challenged. Or if it's been challenged, not more successful. So, you know, this was a decision that made a lot of law professors freak out. Law professors freak out far too often, especially on Twitter, they're the worst. Uh, if you see a law professor screaming on Twitter, they're probably wrong. Um, you know, just, just tell them to calm down. Um, but law professors freaked out. This is before Twitter, before even email, even people didn't have an email back then. Maybe they did, but some of them didn't. Um, people said, oh my God, the, the, the Supreme Court's going to reverse the New Deal. We're going back to the 1980s, you know, 1920s. It's going to be the, you know, this awful time. It proves to be a fairly non-significant case. You know, we, we cut to the chase in Rach and a few later in this class, and it turns out that there's not much juice here, that, that this entire doctrine doesn't matter too terribly much. But for a few years, people were really worried. Oh, my God, the court's going to throw us back to the 1920s. It's going to end of the world as we know it. And as usual, people overreacted. Okay. Thank God there was no Twitter in the 90s. It would have been terrible. Uh, it's still terrible now. Don't use it. Get off Twitter. It's really bad for you. I, I actually have not checked my notifications since January. I feel much healthier. It exists. But I just don't check it. It's just, it's, it, it exists in the ether. I have like, followers. I'm sure they're... Talking crap about me every day. I don't care. Uh, it's for your own health. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fake famous. Um, I verified and all. Got my blue check mark. All right. Um, it's awful. It's an awful place. All right. Any questions on Lopez? Any questions on Lopez? Okay. Let's go on to the next case. Uh, who are we up to? Uh, I think, Pakesh, are you next? Yes, sir, it's me. Okay, thank you, sir. Do you want to um, you want to please give me the facts in our next case, United States against Morrison? Yes, so from what I've got, it's uh, Congress has passed the Violence Against Women's Act, mm -hmm. and there seems to have been victims of gender violence and they're sitting in federal court for damage. Okay, let me just pause you. It's it's called a Violence Against Women Act, but it actually applies to men as well. That if a you know if a guy gets beat up by his wife, he can actually rely on this statute. So it's, it, it's called VAWA, but it also applies to men as well. I just want to clarify that point. All right, go ahead, Vikesh. Um, yeah, so what I kind of gathered was does Congress have uh, the authority to... Uh, use the Commerce Clause here to regulate against, um, well, to regulate, regulate against violence against genders. Okay, so thank you very much, Vikesh. All right, so this was a, you know, this was a, a fact pattern that um, is more familiar than it than it should be. It, it's, it's tragically common. We had a, uh, a female student at Virginia Tech, 
uh, her name was Christy Broncala, um, and she alleged that two members of the football team had raped her. Morrison was one of them, blank, uh, Crawford was the other one. Um, surprise, surprise, um, the school sort of denies it. Um, the local prosecutor in, uh, was it Black Blacksburg? I think it's Blacksburg, Virginia, um, never brought charges against the players. Um, Broncala then sued both Virginia Tech University and Morrison and Crawford in federal court. Now, at the time, these college players didn't have any money. They were probably judgment proof. Um, they weren't in the NFL. They never went to the NFL, so they had no money. The real reason why she brought the suit was to sue the university, because universities have money. Now, as a general matter, I'm going to summarize a gross statement. You can't sue states, and you can't sue state institutions. Right? Virginia Tech is a state school. It's because of the 11th Amendment. I've actually cut the 11th Amendment from the semester. I just don't have time to teach it. I'm sorry. But if you want to read the chapters in the book on the 11th Amendment, uh, it's an important topic. Now, again, you generally you can't sue a state or a state institution unless Congress gives you permission to do so. And in this statute, it seems that Congress allowed a suit against the state school. Congress created what's called a cause of action, which means you can go to court and you can seek damages against the state. The question presented in Morrison was, could Congress create a cause of action for gender motivated violence, right? Could Congress create a cause of action for gender motivated violence? All right, so let's look at a series of questions. So let's look at question number eight. I know I skipped around a bit, but uh, try to keep, try to, oops, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, multiple choice. So look at question number eight, please. And let's, I wanna ask you a series of questions. So the first question, question number eight, gender motivated violence is interstate commerce. So there, 20 seconds for this one. Okay, good. All right, now question number nine. I'll go over them in a minute, I promise. Question number nine, gender motivated violence is Intrastate economic activity. Okay, another 15 seconds. Okay, good. Okay, now question 10. Gender motivated violence has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Gender motivated violence has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Who's putting E? There's no E. That's not an option here. A or B. Thank you. Okay. Last one, I promise. I'll go over all four of them in a row. Now question 11, Congress can regulate gender motivated violence. Okay, another 15 seconds. I don't see a question 11. We re just read it again because I don't see it. Congress can regulate gender motiva motivated violence. True or false? And by the way, the numbering on the eye clicker is not going to match up the numbering on my document because I, I jump around a little bit. I apologize for that. Okay, good. All right. Uh, 
Bryce, let's start with you. Yes, sir. Let's go back to the uh, the first question we asked. Gender motivated violence is interstate commerce. I put false. Okay, why? Um, actually, for the answer to question nine, because it's not economic activity. That's wrong. Oh. That's actually not. That's they're not opposites. In, in, you're, you're right, this answer is false. But what is the definition of interstate commerce? Isn't it uh, intercourse between the states? Good. Yeah, good. That's the definition of, 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 of commerce. You always go back to intercourse. And, and Bryce, what case does that come from? The intercourse case? Uh, I remember. I'm not good with case names. I need to start getting better at that. Oh, that's why I'm asking. Um, what was it about? Give me the facts of the case, if that's, if that's easier for you. Did it have to do with the wharf? Involve water, yes. Uh, one second. I know the name. We have two cases involving wharfs, which is why I'm hedging. Baron v. State no, Baltimore? no, it's not Baron. You're in the right uh, class, though. Gibbons v. Ogden. Gibbons. Okay. Okay. So the answer here is false, right? Gender motivated violence is not interstate commerce because it's not in commerce among the several states. It's not intercourse. That's Gibbons. Okay. Very good. Uh, Clay, you here? Yes, sir. Okay. Is gender motivated violence intrastate economic activity? No, sir. Tell me why. Uh, I honestly admit that Chief Justice Frankfurt's broke majority opinion <laughs> implied the economic non economic distinction that gender motivated crimes and violence are not in any sense of the phrase economic activity. Right. How, how do you think rank was understood economically? I think you're on mute. Uh, no, sir, I'm just thinking for my Oh, ah, okay. Well, that, 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 that also, that's also an excuse. That's good. Um, How do you think rank was understood economic activity? Like commerce to a point, but Economic activity is what Congress can regulate. And you know, you're hearing me circular, right? Yes, sir. Why do you think... Okay, so gender motivated violence. We're talking about sexual assault here, right? Is sexual assault economic in nature? No, sir. Why not? Um, there is not a transaction of goods or... Money. Money. I think that's what you're getting. Okay, good. All right, so I think the... The, 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 the court here is basically saying that economic activity requires some sort of monetary exchange, some sort of creation of, of a transaction. And, 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 and violence is not that. Okay, good. All right, let's look at number 10. Uh, Matthew, you here? Hi, Professor. I'm here. All right, Matthew, let's look at question number, what I call question number 10. Does gender-motivated motiv violence have a substantial effect in interstate commerce? What would you put here? Well, so I think I actually put A, um, and I base that on what I read in the case. <clears throat> However, I think the, probably the, the correct answer is B. Um, and, I, and I put A because I felt like they just they talked about the research and everything that went into this uh, this act, the the VA, uh, it's the VAWA. VAWA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I put A, but I think it's probably B. Well, why do you think it's B? Why are you doubting yourself? Well, for... <coughs> I guess because of the ruling in the case and also um, kind of going along with the previous uh, answers, you know, substantial effect um, is, is related to economic activity. You shouldn't doubt yourself. The answer is A. Oh, all right. You, you were exactly right. Then, you, then you, you, lost the, you lost it. Let me tell you why. Most of you got this wrong, by the way. 6% got this wrong. The court says that there were a lot of findings from Congress that domestic violence, that violence against women, did have an effect on interstate commerce. And that was an effect that was substantial. That people who were involved in abusive relationships, they couldn't work as well, they couldn't contribute to the economy, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, uh, uh, Joe Biden, one of his biggest legislative accomplishments was VAWA. This is like one of his biggest things that he worked on. And then the Supreme Court declared part of it unconstitutional. 
it's sort of, we're living just in a simulation where the same people just cycle through year after year. You'll see it over and over again. Just there's nothing ever changes. Uh, just just in this, in this groundhog day loop that that never ends. But the answer is A. Gender motivated violence has a substantial effect in interstate commerce. But so what? You only can use a substantial effects test for economic activity. That's why I put this question here, right? Because this is not economic activity, the substantial effects test is irrelevant. In other words, all of Congress's findings about how domestic violence has an effect in commerce were irrelevant because the thing they were regulating itself was not economic activity. So in other words, even though Congress spent all this time making these detailed, intricate findings about, that, about how domestic violence affects interstate commerce, it didn't matter because what they're regulating was interstate, what was interstate non-economic activity. So this economic versus non-economic line proved to be very, very significant. Jose, you here? Yes, sir. All right, let's go to our last question then, question 11. Can Congress regulate gender-motivated violence? Um, if that violence is directed at the instrumentalities, channels, uh, or goods involved in interstate commerce, then yes. If not, no. Uh, true or false? That, 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 those are your choices. <laughs> true, I think they can, yes. Okay, well, I, I, you, you, this is why I hate multiple choice questions, right? Uh, if someone's engaging in gender motivated violence on a train that's traveling between states, I think, yes, Congress can regulate this. But in this case, Oh, in this case, no. What's the answer here? Uh, false. Okay, thank you. Right. I suppose if someone's on a train and there's domestic violence occurring in a, in a sleeper car on a train, I suppose, um, that's within Congress's powers. But here the answer we're looking for is false. But I, I, I appreciate your creativity. Uh, this is why I hate multiple choice questions for exams, because no matter how hard I think about a question, some very you know bright student comes up with an answer. The ha, black man, you didn't see this? Like, no, you're right. So that's why all my exams are multiple choice. All right, that's the whole thing in Lopez. I'm sorry, not Lopez, Morrison. That's the whole thing in Morrison. The whole thing in Morrison is this. Domestic violence is local activity, but it's non-economic. And Congress cannot regulate non-economic activity through the substantial effects test. The substantial effects test only applies to economic activity. Doesn't matter what Congress found, et cetera. Now, again, if, if, if to Jose's point, uh, 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 you know, if there was domestic violence on a train as it was going across state lines, okay, then I'll, I think we have, may have a different case. But here, this was violence that occurred in a single, you know, city in Virginia. Um, Rehnquist also says that historically, the police power was responsible. The state was responsible for protecting people from violence. And it's really not the power of the federal government to permit this sort of um, uh, legal action in courts. All right. Questions on the majority opinion in Lopez. I keep saying Lopez, I'm sorry, and Morrison. By the way, uh, a trick you can use to remember the cases, uh, this is how I remember it. Lopez came first, Morrison came second. How do you remember that? Well, L in the alphabet comes for M, right? L, M, Lopez, Morrison. That's how I remember it in law school, and it sort of stuck with me now for many years. Uh, but when you're remembering the, the progression of the Commerce Clause cases, you first have Lopez in 95, and then the next case, M. Morrison, you have in 2000. Make sense? Okay. Um, again, after Morrison, again, the law professors were freaking out. They always do. Uh, they're saying, oh, my God, how can this be? The Supreme Court's going to throw us back in the dark ages. What are they going to do? Uh, you know, they're going to dismantle the New Deal tomorrow. What are they going to do? But... In reality, all the court was saying is we're not going any further, that we're going to have this line between economic and non-economic activity. And if Congress wants to regulate this economic activity, sorry, 
If Congress wants to regulate local activity, it has to be economic in nature. Denver, I saw a hand, the hand dropped. I was just going to say, don't you have federal uh, hate crime law as well? Uh, regulate violence against women? You do. The federal hate crime laws are actually a little bit different. Um, they're not based solely on the Commerce Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause. They're actually based right. also on the 13th and 14th Amendments, right. uh, which prohibit different forms of, of uh, discrimination. So those are a little bit different. Uh, but this was just purely domestic, local domestic violence. There was not any sort of a, a 13th or 14th Amendment issue. Okay. Makes sense? Yes, Lainey, go ahead. So I know we're doing constitutional law, but um, one of the things in the majority opinion was the suppression of violent crime and a vindication of victims is a police power reserved for the state. So it's not that we don't care about the victim. It's not that we're okay with the violent crime. It's it just needs to be prosecuted in the, in the states. Is, is that, I don't see that as a bad thing. Well, no, that Rehnquist says that the police power historically was run by the states. The states were responsible for it. Uh, I think why this case became such a flashpoint is that the state police didn't do anything. In other words, what happens when the state police are not enforcing people's civil rights and they're not protecting the people from violence? And this, I mean, look, this was a college football town. These football players are very popular. And I, I suspect there's pressure not to throw the football players in jail. And that's why Ms. Uh, Broncala went to court, a uh, federal court, to seek uh, damages. But as a general matter, I think Laney's right. The state should be the ones prosecuting police. It right? doesn't mean that this violence goes unpunished. But in this case, perhaps unfortunately, um, Broncala was not given her the justice that she, uh, uh, that she would have otherwise gotten if these were just two random guys, not football players. Yeah, that makes sense, Lainey? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other... I guess the whole town should have just, I don't know, riled up against... I, I'm not saying I didn't want her to have justice. Hmm? Small towns go crazy over football, I guess. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this was, this case was kind of like a preview of things to come. Um, you know, I went to Penn State, right? Yeah. Um, College football towns tend to cover up bad things about their approval programs. Um, and this stuff goes on for a very long time. Um, a lot of coaches and college presidents and other people have lost their jobs over these sorts of issues in the last few years. Um, but yeah, this was you know in the early 90s, the mid-90s, which was some time ago when this happened. Okay. Yeah, the Joe Paterno statue came down, um, you know, pretty quickly. They, they they carted the statue almost overnight in the dark of night, uh, sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions on Morrison? Okay. Let's go into the last case, which is um, Gonzalez versus Rach. And it's pronounced Rach, R-A-Y-T-C-H, just... It's not Reich or Reich, it's Reich. Um, let me uh, uh, ask a, a question number 12. The cultivation of marijuana is interstate commerce. The cultivation of marijuana is interstate commerce. Okay. Another five seconds. Good. All right, now do question 13. The, the cultivation of marijuana is interstate <coughs> economic activity. The cultivation of marijuana is interstate economic activity. 
another 15 seconds. All right, five more seconds. All right, I'll stop it here. Uh, Spencer, I think you're next. Yeah. Spencer, I'll start with question 13. What'd you put here? Uh, that was the one whether it was interstate commerce. No, 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 no. Uh, this is the question 13. Uh, was it intrastate economic activity? I would say no. Okay, why do you say no? Just because there was no like buying or selling of it or just, it's similar just to manufacturing. Um, and there was no- Is that, is that, is, it. is that what Justice Stevens held for the majority? No, he said that it was uh, interstate commerce. I don't know, I'm asking one question at a time. Did, what did Justice Stevens say? Was the cultivation of marijuana interstate economic activity? Yes. Why? It said it was similar to like the, uh, it affected the supply and demand. Um, that's what the majority said, was that um, it could have effect on price. Let's see what he says. Uh, high demand in the interstate market would draw. No, you're going interstate. Market. You're going interstate. I'm asking intrastate. Was the cultivation of marijuana intrusted? It's fine. It's fine. I don't care about the dog. That's my dog. My dad's having surgery, so I'm babysitting the dog. Was the cultivation of marijuana interstate economic activity, according to the majority? Yes. Okay. Tell me why. I guess because it was regulated under California. No, 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 no. Gresh, are you here? Gresh, are you here? Professor, it's Gracia. Oh, Gracia, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. Gracia, is the cultivation of marijuana interstate economic activity? Um, I put true. Okay, tell me why. I would put more so just because it has to deal with um, parties doing something, I mean, like within the state. And that's where they're going to be growing the marijuana. So I figured. But is was... is simply and cultivation means growing. Is simply growing pot, putting plants in this. I'm sorry, putting seeds in the soil, putting some water on it, putting fertilizer. I don't know. Is that act economic activity? Um, if it's just cultivation, um, I guess not. What did the majority say though? The majority said yes. Why? Um, I, they said it would undercut uh, the interstate market. Of you, that you're, 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 you're giving me the, the next step. You're, you're telling me step number two. On step number one. Why is the cultivation of marijuana economic activity? How does Justice Stevens know this? I'm guessing it would not be because it affects the price. No, and you shouldn't be guessing. Um, uh, Colin, you here? Yes, sir. How does Justice Stevens know that the local cultivation of marijuana is interstate economic activity? Well, I mean, I, I believe he, he talks about how, uh, I mean, there is the, he talks about the black market and how you're, you're going inter interstate. You only, Colin, what is the requisite? What is the requirement to go to the substantial effects test? In order to go to the substantial effects test, what do you need to first show? That it's necessary. Well, the necessary and proper clause needs to be used. I, I'm, I apologize, sir. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Ashley? Um, the first question or the second question about substantial effects? First question. What's the first question uh, we have to ask ourselves? Justice Stevens relied, or uh, found it to be an economic activity based on the Webster's definition of economic. Thank you. My goodness. 
Yes, four people. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, tell us, how does Justice Stevens define an economic activity? Uh, the Webster Dictionary defines it as a production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. And since they were producing them and, I guess, consuming them, uh, it <laughs> yeah. would fall into economic activity. And then you could use it. Okay, the that's exactly right. All right, thank you, Ashley. The first step, right, the first thing to think about, and that's why I put the questions in these, and in, in, I'm going over these questions in this sort of reverse order. Is the activity being regulated? Is the cultivation of marijuana economic activity? All of you are giving the stuff about interstate commerce. That's not where I'm at yet. In order to get to the interstate commerce hook, you first need an economic activity. Possessing a gun in a school zone, not economic activity. Gender motivated violence, non economic activity. But cultivating marijuana, Stephen says, is an economic activity. And how do you know this? He looks to our favorite dictionary. It's not my favorite at all. Is Webster's Third International Dictionary. Actually, Justice Scalia hated Webster's Third. Um, he hated it. He, he would criticize it all the time. He said they made lots of mistakes in there. Um, Webster's Third Dictionary defines economic as, quote, the production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. The production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. This is a broad definition, a very broad definition. Um, here you're creating com commodities, you're creating marijuana, you're putting seeds in the, in the soil and then you're growing into these big leafy plants. Right? That's step one. We have economic activity. Okay, Lauren, you here? Yes, I'm here. What's step two, right? After you have economic activity, what's the next thing you have to ask yourself of whether Congress can regulate it? It has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. That's good. Just instead of saying with it, I don't like pronouns. Instead of saying it, what has a substantial effect in interstate commerce? Whether the home growing. Yes. Of yes. Whether the local cultivation of marijuana has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Okay, Lawrence, now I answer that question. Does the local cultivation of marijuana? have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? Um, the court said yes for the reasons everyone else checks in. Oh, good. I appreciate that. But Lauren, just one more, if I can follow up, please. Um, did Rach and Monson by themselves have a substantial effect? Just these two little farmers out in California? Um, I don't think so. What do you have but to do? Look at it in the aggregate. Which is which case? Wickard Bingo. Perfect. You Do you see how much work you have to do to get to Wickard, right? You don't just start with Wickard, right? You first have to ask, is the activity economic in nature? They have to say, okay, does this activity have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? And the answer is probably no. We're just talking about two farmers, right? They're making you know, a fairly small quantity of weed, right? It's not, it's not a significant, you know, there's not Tegrity Farms, it's not that much. It's a fairly, <laughs> South Park reference, it's, not, it's a fairly small quantity of homegrown weed. But in the aggregate, if all these local farmers created this local marijuana, it would have a substantial effect in interstate commerce. Now, Aaron, I know people said it before, but just help us repeat. What exactly is its effect on interstate commerce? Um, I know the court was saying that if um, if everybody grows their own weed, there's not going to be any out in the interstate commerce <laughs> or out in the like nation for people to buy. Yeah, you can't go to Whole Foods right and buy marijuana. <laughs> right, but I just I, I don't want to be facetious, but where exactly is this interstate marijuana market? What, what what is this market that he keeps speaking of? Is, there, is this something where I can go and shop? 
Not today, back in the 90s. No. Um, I know they said only a few states had it legally, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure. But, but Aaron, just walk me through. If Diane Monson and Angel Rage are allowed to grow local marijuana, what exactly is the effect in interstate commerce? Just, just spell it out for me. Um, I guess, I mean, the aggregation principle. Good. So if, so if those two, but, okay, let me see how I'm trying to say this. Um, if basically every person who grew marijuana did what uh, Monson and Rage were doing, Good. then there would be none in the interstate commerce. So if you take it in the aggregate, Right. In other words, let me let me just clarify this. Uh, I, th I think you're really close, uh, Aaron. If Rach and Monson grow their own marijuana, what are they not doing? Buying it from others. Ah, and does the failure to buy marijuana from other states affect interstate commerce? Yes. Okay, that's it. It's an insane holding. Just I want to just put putting aside, right? Because Rach and Monson are growing their own weed, they're not going to buy marijuana from, say, Nevada. And because you're not buying marijuana from Nevada, they're affecting the, the prices of marijuana nationwide. And Congress can take steps to prevent this black market weed from being sold. It's just, it's an insane holding, right? It just, it, it, it defies logic um, that this is something Congress wants to do. But Stephen says it's not for us to decide. If Congress thinks that the way to prohibit marijuana nationwide is by undercutting this black market, they can do that. Right. At that point, I don't really care if you agree with it or not. That's not very important. Randy still just has not gone over it, which is fine. Uh, but I just want you to understand that there are the steps. You first ask yourself, is this economic activity? Then you say, well, is there a substantial effect? And though maybe not, okay, go on to aggregation. But the, there, there are steps you have to jump through. You can't just say, of course, there's a black market. You need to do stuff first, which is why I, I called, I think, four or five people and also what uh, – mean and i don't like being mean i don't like it but it, it's i need you to understand this chronology and but eventually we got to the right answer okay everyone get the commerce clause analysis so far yes denver go ahead uh, do you kind of agree to uh to range's argument that it's <laughs> that, that would that would almost be every single economic activity that congress could regulate yeah i mean look I'll, I'll give my own take on this it's not very important but i'll, I'll tell you what i think um I think the line that rank was drew between economic and non-economic activity was somewhat artificial. That wasn't a real line from the prior cases. But once you say that we have this line of what economic and non-economic is, then Stephen comes up with his dictionary to say, ha, ah, here's the definition of economic. It means everything. So it was sort of this sort of short-sighted error, right? It's like, ah, oh, let's draw this line. But then eight years later, a guy comes up with a dictionary. It's like, ah, oh, but here, this line means everything. So, you know, it was... If you're stressing this word economic, right? The word economic is not in the Constitution. The word effect is not in the Constitution. The word substantial is not in the Constitution. I'm with Justice Thomas, but I usually am, uh, you know. But but th this this was unavoidable. Uh, keep in mind that Justice Kennedy was in the majority in Rage. He dis he was also the majority in Lopez. So Kennedy was always very uh, flip flopping back and forth. He was never wedded to a particular issue. He always tried to keep things as fluid as possible. All right, so questions on the majority in, in range, right? Um, the majority holds that this is economic activity. And because there's this economic activity, you can aggregate it together to see if there's substantial effects. And that's why this is something that Congress can do. They can ban locally grown marijuana. All right, questions on Stevens. Now let's talk about the Scalia concurrence. Um, the Scalia concurrence proves to be very important. And you'll see why when you say the Obamacare case. But Scalia didn't really agree with the majority. And if he did, he didn't want to admit it. He didn't like, he and Stevens did not get along very well. They, 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 they were always at odds in all these cases. So Scalia says, well, I, I kind of agree, but not really. I won't really tell you why. Um, 
And Scalia wrote about the necessary and proper clause, which I think is a far more important element of this case. Um, here's what he said. Scalia said, I don't know that this is economic activity. I don't really need to decide this. But let's just assume this is non-economic activity. Right? Scalia says, Congress can regulate local non-economic activity. If, comes the if, if those laws are essential to a broader regulatory scheme, Congress can regulate local non-economic activity if those laws are essential to a broader regulatory scheme. Um, in this case, we have the Controlled Substances Act. It's a nationwide, right? It's a nationwide scheme to reduce the number of controlled substances. If Rach and Monson are allowed to grow weed in their backyard, it could undermine it could frustrate Congress's nationwide scheme. So Scalia says that before Congress can go after this local activity, the Commerce Clause isn't really relevant to Scalia's opinion, right? What matters is the, the Necessary and Proper Clause really standing by itself. That is, the Necessary and Proper Clause empowers Congress to regulate local activities that can frustrate Congress's regulatory schemes. And Scalia didn't make this up. He got this from Lopez. And I don't think Lopez quite understood what they were doing with the sentence. But Scalia would latch on to the sentence in Rach. Stevens, I think, reaches the same conclusion about necessary and proper. So there were really six votes for this position. Although I think Scalia articulates it uh, in a much more clear fashion than does Stevens. Let me just make one other point. We always think of the necessary and proper clause as like a single item. Necessary and proper, right? But there's two words. There's necessary and there's proper. Scalia suggests that these are separate inquiries, right? That something can be necessary but not proper, right? Something can be necessary but not proper. Here, Scalia says it's both necessary and proper. We'll do other cases later this semester where they're not the same. In the Obamacare case for next class, which I think will be on Wednesday after the holiday, the majority finds that the Affordable Care Act mandate is necessary, meaning useful, from Chief Justice Marshall, but was not a proper exercise of federal power. Right? It was necessary, but not a proper exercise of federal power. This was a significant development, and Scalia really telegraphed this in rage, and people did not understand it well. That's why Randy, I think, did, because he lost the case. He got beat. He, he lost six to three. He only got O'Connor, uh, Rehnquist, and Thomas, and and, and Rehnquist at this point was basically dying. He, he, he would not live very well. He died, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think he died in 2005. So he was, he was not well at this point. He was very late in his career. Okay. Questions on Rach for now. Yeah, Lainey, go ahead. And by the way, I'll, I'm going to start the minute poll so you can start typing your answer whenever you need to. I'll start it now. Go ahead, Lainey. So, um, I'm sorry, what did you say when Scalia was writing, he grabbed from Lopez? He, when Scalia wrote his concurrence, he captured from Lopez this, this notion of these broad regulatory schemes. That when um, Congress, um, when Congress has these broad schemes, they can regulate local activity if those local activities 
they frustrate those broad schemes. Right? That was con that was that was Scalia's major contribution. Thank you. Yep. And I encourage you to to I always want you to watch the videos, but definitely watch videos here. We included uh, Randy's arguments where he makes some gross jokes about whether. <laughs> What, what, the same activity can be economic and non-economic, non which is basically sex, whether you're paying for it or not paying for it. The same activity can, can shift, and that you have to get fun with that one. But I'll leave it there. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I have a bunch of people coming today for office hours. If you want to come along, just sit in the queue, and I'll... I'll let you know when you're there, but I think I have a few people lined up with appointments, but I'll be here as long as you need. Uh, have an enjoyable Labor Day weekend. We'll all be staying home and doing nothing. Uh, and hopefully I'll see you all next Wednesday. Thank you.